What up, bros? What up, bros? I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to Bra Meets World. When it's Bra Meets World. Your boy Meets World Fun Cause, and this is an extra credit episode where we will Sitch. be talking about the latest in the Scream franchise, Scream 6. Anyone who has listened, anyone who knows me, anyone who's just like aware knows that this was my Super Bowl. This was me. Like, this was Christmas. This is everything. And I'm so excited. I, I like, I, I'm really excited to hear your thoughts because we have not expressed to each other. Uh, well, I expressed to you a moment I left the theater how I felt about it, but I have no idea what TC thinks about it. So, <laughs> yeah, we're taking a break from our typical Boy Meets World conversation. And we know we've been away for a while, but don't worry, we have episodes coming out soon. So, we're going to be back on season six, but the scream movie coming out if our longtime listeners know scream is siege's favorite franchise so we had to put out a mini episode and i have so many thoughts controversial hot takes Ooh, that I so can't excited wait so excited to share with you um oh, by the way so yeah. uh you just reminded me i'm siege <laughs> yeah i'm tony curtis i'm your that's how excited we are to jump into this conversation we were like fuck the intro we don't need any of it <laughs> Uh, yeah, all right, so, like, starting off with our morning announcements, um, just to give you guys, as T had kind of um, alluded to earlier, we know, we are in the middle of season six, it's kind of been dragging, you guys, I, life just comes at you fast, we've each been dealing with personal things um, that kind of took us out for, like, an entire month of recording. But that said, we are back. We are dedicated to getting this out. Just so you all know, not only do we have more guests coming for season six, we are back again for, we've been invited back again for pod season two. So, Oh my God, I can't even one. get into that shit, bro. I've <laughs> been specifically holding back all of my thoughts on season two of Pod Meets World to not talk about on this podcast. So I have nothing but hot takes for when we go back. <laughs> Uh, definitely like like you're right now that we've done it i have like so many notes on like all right these like i know what questions i want to ask I, I, and oh. I've, I've had ones that like have been burning for a while that i'm like all right this is the season to ask this question um so in other morning announcements we know that you all were really excited to hear our thoughts on um some some political action that's going on um for those of you who don't know Ben Savage, um, aka Corey Matthews, is running for U.S. Congress, uh, specifically for I think it's the 30th district, which includes Hollywood, where we live. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was going to say this right off the bat: um, we do not know Ben. We have not spoken to him the way that we have the other cast. Uh, I will do my best, out of respect of the show and the cast, to to be open to a lot of things. However, he is specifically running in my district. And as a potential constituent, I'm going to air some of my uh, thoughts. <laughs> well, you know, okay, I'll say this because you're right. I don't really know a ton about Ben Savage's uh, political stances, specifically because he's not super transparent with a lot of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but... I did see his, uh, he did a guest shot on Good Morning America the other day yeah. to kind of promote his run. Yeah. And, uh, yo, just from watching that interview, and guys, please look up the Ben Savage Good Morning America run. Uh, video you should so link you can it. Watch see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, this motherfucker looks nervous. He, he, he does not seem comfortable, like, playing that politics game. And I know he has a passion for it, but it, this, at least on that interview, he seemed so nervous. Yeah, you got to sell that charisma. If you like, specifically, if you want people, let, let's let not deny it. Like, as much as he wants to distance himself, even in the clip that we saw, they play Boy Meets World. We like, I, I literally laughed out loud when they rolled the clip. Uh, but it's something like you are tied to Boy Meets World, you're using the name recognition. You're going to have to give us some of that Corey charisma. Like, that's what you're going to have to do a little bit if you want to sell. And I'm not saying that you have to be Corey because you are your own person. And Ben Savage has his own right, his own thoughts. He's not the same character. But you are 
kind of relying on name recognition in order to get people out to vote for you. And if that's the case, you're going to have to sell that that character a little bit. That's that's my initial thought. Go ahead. I have a hot take, which is, okay, the real (laughs) ones know what I'm talking about. The real ones who have been watching, like, the convention videos, yeah. who watched all the girl meets world press. I know where you're going, but keep going. Who listened to the DVD commentary know that like Ben has never been that ultra charismatic dude. He's always seemed a little bit of all the central casts, the most like at least publicly the most reserved Absolutely. and the the most seemingly uncomfortable with the attention, even though. You know, Will Friedle has struggled with anxiety and, and Ryder Strong seems like someone who doesn't really care for the public eye very much. They seem like they have a far easier time talking in, on, in front of people with a microphone than Ben ever Absolutely. did. And so in the comments, when I'm like watching the Good Morning America video and they were like, oh, you would think that a TV star would have a little bit more charm. And I'm like, no, the real ones know that Ben's never been that dude. Here's the thing. I, you're right. I watched it being like, oh, I, I, this is exactly what I expected him to be like. However, yeah. I'm saying someone on his team needs to be like, look, we need to give you a script and you need to ham it up just for this cycle. That's what you got to do. It, like you're trying to sell politics is all about selling yourself and your ideas to people. And if you're using name recognition and that character's name recognition is charismatic, that's what you have to bring or else it's just, it's off brand. It's going to feel disjointed because people are going to remember court. Like even in that clip, they're yeah. going to remember that passion. They're going to remember that character and you got to sell them that character a little bit. It's what Trump did. It's what Reagan did. It's what Arnold Schwarzenegger did. It's like, if you want to be in politics as an actor, you have to be willing to give the people what they want a little bit. And if you're not willing to do that, then you're really not ready for politics. Yeah. And that's just a blanket statement. I'm not calling anybody out, but I'm <laughs> saying if you want to go down this road, that's that's what you got to do. Here's a controversial take. <laughs> I wonder if... Okay, because here's something I will say. From watching his Good Morning America video, it seems as though he has a true passion for this in his own yes. right. Yes. Like, he went to college for this. Like Absolutely. I just wonder, I feel kind of bad for him because I wonder if he ever really wanted to be an actor. Was this thing that he ever had the choice to make really? Like, you know what I mean? He was in Little Monsters when he was, like, <laughs> five years old. You know what I mean? Like I do know what you What say... In, do, did he have in determining the his career trajectory? But also, like, at what point did he say to himself, what do I want to do? What do I love? What do I care about? And I don't know that acting was ever it. I just feel like it's something that was like the family business he got into. Fred's getting a lot of good attention doing this. He's making a lot of money. You're cute. Well, let's throw you in the Wonder Years episode. Oh, they really like you. Let's keep having you come back. Oh, now you're on the series for seven years. And so, like, I just have to wonder, like, based off of his overall persona, if that was something he ever really gave a fuck about. And if he didn't, that's fine. I just, like, from watching his, like, on-screen persona, he just always seems a little uncomfortable in the line. Here's the thing. I'm going to say, whether or not he ever wanted to do it is irrelevant specifically yeah. in this role it's what you it's the brand that you have yeah anyone yeah. who's good at marketing anyone who's good at politics anyone who knows how to sell is going to tell you you got to go with what people think you are in order mm-hmm. to get them on board you can do the bait and switch plenty of politicians do it get in the office and be like this is the real me and it would not be the first time but i'm saying that if you go into it like like what we know about uh, child actors and Cole Sprouse um, is coming out saying, you know, like how his relationship with his parents is because he was forced into being a child actor. We hear all the stories from um, the cast and crew um, about what it was like to be a child actor. I'm not saying that he that like that has to be the center of his platform. I'm saying he has to bring that personality because that personality is what people know. If you're going to leave And it's the only on reason the... he's on Good Morning America is cuz he's on Good Morning World. Absolutely. Yeah. Like name another candidate who's been on Good Morning America who's gotten like that kind of spot in time. You know what I mean? So I'm just going to say It also seems like something that's impossible for the rest of the cast not to have to like 
talk about. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like everyone's going to be like, so what do you think about Ben running? Like, I don't know. It just seems like I mean, something that... Like, like, you, you, your thoughts can be like, if that's what Ben wants to do, then that's what Ben wants to do. Like, you, like, you don't have to align with someone's politics to support them. And, sure, yeah. like, imagine if someone came to us and was like, hey, that kid you went to high school with is running for our... Uh, for Congress, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Like, if you haven't spoken to them in a while, or if you guys, you yeah. know, you're just gonna be like, if that's what they want to do, cool. Like, what are his, what are his policies? Where does he stand? That's the really important thing. And to that, I will say there have been plenty of people who've asked me, and I'm just gonna, again, I'm gonna be honest and and raise my concerns. A lot of this, as someone who lives in the area, it feels a little. Like I'm thinking twice. I was gonna use one word, but I'm I'm thinking twice about what I'm hearing because it feels very much like gentrification at its max. The area that he's talking about is known for being diverse and it's known for being inclusive. And yes, LA has a lot of problems as any major city does because of the financial situation that the city has caused. However, I'm hearing tones of adding more police. I'm hearing tones of dealing with the homeless population. And it's like, let's be honest here. Most of those are things that those who can in this town just don't want to deal with. They don't want to see it. Um, and I'm not going to lie. It's, it feels a little secret conservative to me. Well, you know what? I'm going to open up the platform to Ben Savage. Please come on our show <laughs> and tell us how you plan to govern this would be this the most area. amazing like, reason that he would join. <laughs> I honestly, like, if Ben Savage was like, hey, guys, I want to come on. I don't want to talk shit about Boy Meets World. I just want to talk politics. Dream try, do good, bro. Like, we're, we're here Dream for it. Try, we're here do good. To we're here for it. that. Should be his campaign slogan, by the way. If it's not, he's so stupid. Here's the, wait, wait, wait. So I don't. Again, you guys, we're going to get into this, <laughs> but trust me. Um, I I looked at the Good Morning America clip as you had mentioned, and right off the bat, I was like, they are skirting around that do good. Like they keep circling around it, and I'm like, it's almost there. Just say it. Yeah. Just say it. And you, again, you say it, and you're good. But I feel like he's trying to distance himself. Anyway, we've talked about this enough. Let's get yep. into why. I do want to say one thing real fast, positive, which is that he got um, engaged like a month or so ago. Like, so congratulations Mazel. on Ben. He seems like he's he's really trying to, to live the life he wants to live. Yeah, live a life defined by his own terms, which is something that we heard Ryder talk about when we interviewed them too, which is something extremely difficult for child actors. So whatever he's doing, I wish him the best and I wish him happiness and we can get into the politics of it when he's on our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, what you've all been waiting for, at least what I've been waiting for, for mm. sure, is Scream 6. Okay. Scream 6. So let's talk about it. All right. So first of all, right off the bat, for those of you who don't know, we're just going to get directly into it. We've seen the movie. We hope you've seen the movie. This will be a spoiler-filled review reaction. Just know that we're talking about shit <laughs> because we've seen the movie. If you haven't seen it, pause it, go see it, and then come check it out. All right. So Scream 6, T. Where do you want to begin? Because I can begin anywhere. I'm so excited. I'm just like, I don't, I don't you know. You know what? I do you want to give a quick recap of oh, the you film? Do the, just tell me about it. Like, like a tell me. Yeah, I don't really have a tell me about it prepared per se, but if you just want to give a quick off the cuff summary, like I can give one as well. Like I, I just Let's feel like it will it. help to, to go ahead. It. So yeah. this will be a tell me about it sans rap. So if, sorry, y'all. We ain't got the rap. We weren't there for it. But if you have a rap, again, hit us up. Let us know what you think. So. Four survivors of the Ghostface murders leave Woodsboro behind for a fresh new start in New York City. However, they soon find themselves in a fight for their lives when new killer embarks on a bloody rampage. You guys, I gotta say. First thoughts, Siege, let's hear it. First thoughts right off the bat. I, I don't I don't know where you stand. I thought this was the best scream since one. Like it goes interesting scream one, and then this one for me. I I loved it. I thought this. Here's how I feel about Scream franchise. A, I feel like it's one of the better franchises. Like we're talking hits after hits. 
even the ones that are bad are better than some of the ones that than some of the best ones in other franchises. Like Scream is just like a really fantastic franchise. And on top of that, I will also say that this this one seemed to understand everything I hated about the last one. It mm. really responded to it. Like, I don't know if they were in the threads. I don't know if they listened to the last episode. But I will say that every concern that I had about the last one was addressed in this one. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's way more gorier than I was expecting. You know how I am with gore. I was like, oh, y'all going in. <laughs> yeah. But right off the bat, I thought that the story worked. I thought that the characters worked. And I really, really, I was here for the good time. What was your first reaction? Okay, I had a fantastic time in my theater experience. I know you like to go to a Thursday night show. I like a Friday night show. A Friday I night like show it. is probably good. It's probably more family. It's probably more... It, it is. It's like there's more kids there. Like, I don't know. There's something about like a slasher movie that's like, I kind of want to see this movie with teenagers. Like, it, that's just a great barometer for that kind of setting for me. So, um, what Friday night had a great time in my theater experience. I will also say that I watched every Scream movie leading up to yeah. the release of this one. I know you watched all of them not too long ago as well. Correct. I thought it was a good time. And I'm going to say something really controversial here. Go for it. Go for it. I don't think there's such a thing as a good Scream sequel. I'm What? I'm just going to say What? That. What? The franchise, which I know this movie specifically kind of zeroes in on zeros in on franchises specifically um i feel like there's not a single scream sequel that doesn't have third act problems you know what i'm not going i'm not going i didn't say that it was perfect yeah <laughs> i did not because say it was perfect it, it, i will say this like especially like it, the movies that I, the, the scream sequels that i gravitate towards and this one is in the top of yes. the scream sequels they all have things where I'm just like, oh, if they just changed like these three things, I would like this movie so much more. I, I agree and with that. I agree with that. I, I mean, I'll, I'll get into all my hot takes and stuff, but <laughs> I, I just have to throw this out there that like, other than Scream 1, there has not been a killer reveal that has been satisfying to me. Really? So here's the thing I'm going to say. So right off the bat, again, we told y'all, spoilers, right? I called... I called the killers immediately. In Scream 6? I called it immediately. But to me, they did a good misdirect. This is the first Scream movie with three killers. And I was like, like you, I knew it was two. But then there were people where I'm like, it's got to be you. But then they would just be in the scene. And I'd be like, well... No, but it's got to be you. And then yeah. there were like just little hints and they was like right off the bat, like, let's just, let's talk about the killers. So we get, we actually, this is the fourth scream with four killers because in the very beginning, our opening act, let's, let's, let's like we've, we've jumped around. Well, technically there's five killers because there's two Ghostface yeah. killers that get Well, we've never stabbed. seen the, for in the opening scene, that's why I said there's four. In the opening scene, I'm just going to start there because why not? In the opening scene, we get our I I also judge a screen movie by its opening scene. And yes. this one is up there. It does it right. Like again, last time we had all of we had this uh weird thing with Jenna Ortega and it felt weird and it felt off and the Jenna no Ortega died. opening from Scream Five felt like there's so much of Scream 5 that felt like they were just trying to do a modern retelling of Scream 1. Correct. Whereas this felt new and unique. The idea of having new, Samara Weaving, is that how you say her name? Yeah, Samara, Samara Weaving. Weaving. Yeah. She's, you know, on like, she's at a bar, she's texting someone she's supposed to meet for a date, and that person ends up being really Ghostface. Quickly. Really quickly. Amazing. First of all, what I liked was the idea that when we with the first ring that we hear is actually just at the restaurant. And yeah. I was like, again, that's someone Misdirect. who understands what Scream is about. It's just like we know what you're looking for, completely uh misdirect, subverting that expectation. Her being on her cell phone, immediately she's meeting a guy she's never met before at a bar. We're like, oh, 
I immediately know what it's doing. We all know that that's Ghostface. We all understand that if you're talking to someone on the phone, then we and find what out. A, what a thrill to add on top of like, like dating digitally is already so scary. Correct. But to add Ghostface into the mix, amazing. Absolutely. And then what I also like is the use of the voice modulator in various ways. Very Like we haven't done that since Scream 3, I think. And it's one of those things to where if you have the technology to change your voice, why do you immediately go to Ghostface, especially at this point in time? Like, yeah. I like that they actually, they had the conversation just through text. Then we hear the voice and we're like, oh, he's not, it's not Ghostface voice. It's like a regular dude. Can I just say something real fast? Because yeah. you mentioned Scream 3. The technology in Scream 3 is science fiction. It did <laughs> no, not no, no. exist in 1998. This. It exists now. <laughs> it does, but it's 2023. Now. Like, right now. But, like, just happened that I can make Morgan Freeman my voice. Like, that just happened like a month ago. <laughs> it's so funny you say that because I literally, for uh, those who don't know, for on my birthday, I had like a stabathon marathon. Like, I watched all the screams for my birthday, and we were watching three, and I was like, and what, what? We don't have that technology now. Is when I watched it. And then like three weeks later, they were like, hey, you're allowed to do this on... And I was like, that took AI. We are 20 years beyond that movie. <laughs> and yeah. that movie is just like, oh, everybody has it. Everyone's able to just call we're gonna, it. We're going to... We have a section at the end of this podcast where we talk about the sequels to the other ones. I don't want to spend too much time on yeah, screen thing because I have so many thoughts on that. But yeah, it, it's just funny. This one opening up. up, we have... Again, she's like... He's like, hey, I'm outside... And again, you're like, no, but like also it's the city. So I, I think what I liked about this one, and I always say Scream is what the character, Samara Weaving's character says, and what I believe is that Scream is actually a, a reflection of our relationship to technology at the time. And yep. that, that's that been symbolized by the telephone, but it's just our relation to technology. And I really enjoyed how they use that, how they, they use Reddit, they use dating apps, they use th yeah. cell phones, they use all of those things against us in this movie to subvert our expectations. And I really, really appreciated it. And I also then, love how organically the conversation about what she like sh what she does for a living is that she correct. teaches a classes class on slasher movies so when he organically says so what's your favorite scary movie it doesn't seem like a ghost face thing it just seems like a, oh that's a natural question to ask someone who teaches a class on this absolutely and then when she well like i don't know about your theater but my theater when he goes what's your favorite scary movie she goes not that one I <laughs> again self-awareness it gave us that parody and then um, he gets her out into the alley, and I was like, girl, you gotta be smarter than this. Even in New York, like, mm -hmm. it's an alley. You're not going down an alley, but she, he, she, um, she went because he was like, oh, wait, there's somebody here who's, like, following me. So she went to kind of be protective. It wasn't just out of It's curiosity. the Ted Bundy routine. It's like, I'm in danger. I need help. Can you help? Can you assist me? Correct. Mm. And then... They did that fake out that they do in, um, I know what you did last summer, where she's in the alley, there's people right there, you're looking, and then there's a noise, and you get distracted, you think, but I don't know where a killer. And then when they when they get her, I go, I looked at it, I was like, they're going to unmask the killer right now. Yeah. And I was like, where do we go from here when you unmask the killer in the very first act? And sure enough, they did. Yeah, I was that was like, I love that. I was so surprised. I was like, oh, we're going. What are I honestly, I don't know where we can go from here. And I like that feeling in a new scream franchise. Like, if I don't know where we're going from here, and I'm a huge fan, I was totally down. And then yeah. you know that the killer is you know who the killer is right off the bat. That go that kid goes back to his apartment. Tony Revel. Uh, Revy Laurie, by the way, the kid from yeah. Spider Man, <laughs> Flash. Kid from Spider Man, yeah, yeah. I'm like, yeah, good for him. He's getting work. Yeah, um, he's great. He's great. He, he's talking to his roommate, and they were doing it together. I was like, oh my god, are we doing the cult thing? Like, are we doing the cult following? I, bro, I can't tell you how disappointed I was that this didn't turn into that. We've been talking about that Here's forever. I and... feel like this movie read all the fan theories, and they gave yeah. us a little bit of everything. And I really, really appreciate that because, 
like I was like, oh, we're doing the cult thing. And if you're doing the cult thing, then it really could be anybody. It, it, it Which is so much anybody. scarier. And it is terrifying because I don't know who it could be. And like the idea of like him being on the phone, having a conversation with his roommate. Again, it's a little bit unbelievable that he's on the phone this long. But I also love this idea of just being like, oh, wait a minute. Are you the killer? Tell me what you know about me. If that's if you really are, yeah. <laughs> if you really are my roommate, like how do we meet? Give me some backstory. Again, it's just it's a movie where these people understand the rules even of Ghostface, and they all ask these questions, and they feel you feel like you're smarter than the movie, and then it undermines you. And I really, really appreciated that. I don't know. That's and again, that's just the opening act. I. I I, 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 can go I, on and I have to say that since Scream 4, I have wanted a Scream movie that revolves around the killer's perspective. And so I thought it was incredibly interesting. And But again, it was just a tease until it kind of reverts back into its usual format, which is fine. It's a franchise. It has it's rules. A franchise. Yeah. Um, but I, I did I did enjoy that open. Okay. What did you what's your thoughts on this core four? Here's the thing. I like the core four. I feel like the twins we do enjoy. And also we I like the twins better four. than the sisters, if I'm being honest. I, I agree with you. I like the twins better than the sisters. And I feel like in all honesty, watching in the beginning, I feel like I feel like Jenna Ortega is the weakest link right now. Yeah. Like in the beginning, specifically like the, the character being the bratty little sister. I don't care. I don't want this to define me. It made sense, but it's also like girl. You are a girl of color living in New York. Someone tried to kill you. You gonna be a little bit more realistic. Than this. <laughs> I was. I was also thinking, you know, coming from Scream Five, where she is essentially in the hospital bed for ha- most of the movie, we know her character the least. She is supposed to be the center of this friend group, not her sister. But it feels like the twins should be closer to, um, what's her face, uh, Sam. Sam. Sam than they are with Tara just because of everything they went through in the last movie. It, it, it's just, it's it's an interesting dynamic, but yeah, Tara's character feels like a brand new character because she is so erased from the last movie. Yeah, absolutely. But then also I feel like we've, we've had a core four. It was, it was, um, well, I mean, well now it was three, but like what I'm saying in, in the sequel, it was Randy. It was Sydney. Sydney. It was Gail and Dewey. Dewey. So yeah. a core four made sense. And even when like the core four got challenged, I was like, again, it makes sense. Even like, and I feel like they gave us like this love tra- like this like love story between Chad and Tara in a way that I was like, you are both survivors. You've both grown up together. Like, it makes sense even here. It feels like they're setting them up to be the new Dewey Gale. Exactly. So because of that, I liked what we were doing with the core four. I feel like, uh, what's her name? The the sister twin. Is it Mindy? Mindy, yeah, 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 Mindy. Mindy, yeah. Mindy is, Mindy is a new Randy. She's a new... Um, She's a new Kirby. And we'll new get to Kirby. Kirby but, but yeah. yeah. And we like it. Like she like I like there are just things where she was like, get away from me, ghost face. Like she just kept calling dude. And she's like, no, nah, I'm not doing this. I appreciate it. Yeah. And I really like I like this dynamic because A, the twins seem very believable. You understand their bond. You understand their bond in relation to Tara and kind of like just being older siblings in a way and and looking out because they have also, a way to oh. connect with Tara that Samantha can't because to, Samantha's too busy trying to be the oldest sibling and being like look this yeah. is serious we can't and I like that they they regularly just take the initiative to be like we're not playing by your rules of trying to stay in this situation the moment anyone anyone gets killed Samantha's like we out we move it pack a bag <laughs> the yeah. moment the cops like you can't leave she like watch me <laughs> yeah like, don't leave the state anytime soon bye i'm like we not staying yeah. here if we didn't have to <laughs> so yeah anyway yeah it, you know i have to i really hmm this the twins i love i love the twins because i feel like outside of 
the trauma of what's going on, I kind of know who they are. Yes. And I don't know that I feel that way about Sam, who is our protagonist. I and, don't, but I feel like Sam is, like, to be honest, I'm like, Sydney. Like, she's not, but I'm just like, you've been through some stuff. Like, that is, that understandably is defining you, and you're paranoid, and you're scared, but you're also... You're also very much like, no matter what, I'm not going down like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I have to say that I feel like Sam's character, I would like so much more if she didn't see dead people. I can't believe we're still doing this. Like, it is so strange. Not only that she keeps talking to the ghost of this dead boy that she never met. Yes, it's her father, but she never met him. She always sees him as he was right when he died, which is never how she saw him. So how did she even get this imagery to have this I agree. serial killer imaginary friend? Like, it just feels so silly. Like, you could show Sam, like, I don't know, like, her struggle with enjoying killing Richie yeah. in ways that are more external yes. than having this, like, imaginary drop-dead Fred character that she's having these conversations with, like, oh, you should just kill him. You should stab him. You know you want to. It just feels weird. It's a shortcut, and I will not pretend like it's anything other. It really is, like, a way for us to understand this kind of, like, internal drive that she has for violence. Um, and... I, I agree that it's it's they they kind of took some liberties with that. I do feel like they were smart enough to limit it more this uh movie than they did in the previous one because it does get played out and you are very much like what are we doing here? But it also seems like they may drop that because at the end it seems like that was something that they were like, all right, we don't necessarily need this moving forward. Uh, because she's kind of like cathartically dealt with that. And it's like, I don't have to be my father. I don't have to continue with this, um, which I really enjoyed. Um, um, let's talk about like where, legacy where are characters. You I'm going to talk yeah, about legacy characters. Yeah. Legacy character. Let's talk about how they dealt with Gail and Kirby. Uh, let's start I, with honest, Gail. Gail. I, so Gail being there, it, it feels a little bit like of a retread with like Gail just constantly going back to being that reporter who like wants to scoop and being the reporter who told the story that she promised not to tell. Like that was like a little bit like uh, again, but in a way I, and I will say that I did a lot of this work. The movie doesn't necessarily do a lot of this work, but knowing what I know about Gail, I was, it makes sense that without Dewey, Gail is just like, who am I without like, even in her universe, this Stab franchise. Like, who am I? Like, will people even care? Am I really... Like, this is this has defined my life. This is all I've ever reported on. And every single time, it keeps happening. So, if I don't center myself in this story, what's my identity without it? And then also, them pointing out that she never really had a one-on-one -on -one phone call with Ghostface before also was like, oh yeah, it was like a little unfinished business for her. <laughs> How do they know that? How would they know that? Well, Based on again, the books? I don't know. Yeah, based on the book. I think this 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 franchise does a really good job at being like, hey, there are movies out there. There are books out there. There sure, are sure. YouTube. There's an there extended are... universe. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, there's an extended universe of like, this is how these people know these things. Like, think about it. For me, when we talk about the Stab franchise, the very opening act has Casey's life almost beat for beat. And you're like, no one else was there. How do they know all of this stuff with Casey? Sure, yeah. So it makes sense that like, you're just going to take some creative liberties. Long and short of it all, I did think that they used Gail in a way that made sense in bringing her back. I was like, okay. And then even, like, Gail's chase scene, Gail being the reporter who, like, finds things, like, they're, everyone being like, yo, Gail's a good, she's good at her job. And that's how she gets things. And her being kind of like the seasoned one who's like, I've done this before. When Gail hangs up, she goes, hold on a sec, and hangs up, and the killer goes, wait, what? I was like, yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. hang up and start 69 is ass. Immediately. Again, these writers have seen the the theories. They've seen the threads. They've seen the fan comments. So to give Gail that moment where Gail just hangs up, calls back, we hear the phone ring. I was like, yes, 
yes, more of this thing I didn't like is, and then also, I feel like it's a commentary because it happens all the time in movies when someone has a gun in the house. During a moment of adrenaline and panic, you're trying to open that box. It's not opening. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing. It's just like everyone's like, oh, get a gun for safety. How safe is it if when you need it, you can't access it? She so, had a four code. It was like four digits. And I was just like, you can't remember the four. Well, you it's not the, it's that it's not that you can't remember the four. It's that when you're panicking, you're not pushed. The buttons are sensitive. It's like I, I've had that thing where it's like you need to do so. I'm trying to unlock my phone, and it's just like, no, nah, you hit it. You hit that one letter two cents two times, <laughs> and I'm like, unlock. You know what I mean? I'm Gail Weathers. <laughs> I'm aware that there's new ghost face killings happening. I'm walking around like I'm Dirty Harry. I got the <laughs> shit tucked in my waist. I'm strapped up. <laughs> Like why? Here's the thing. I will say because when Ghostface was like, "I'm wearing a bulletproof vest," I was like, "Okay, why is everyone not?" If I'm Gail, if I'm Kirby, if I'm Samantha, yo, Amazon bulletproof vest, <laughs> stab resistant mesh under all my clothes at all times forever yeah <laughs> I, I will say this that scream loves to throw in a bulletproof vest as a reason for why like uh someone survived getting shot point blank with the bulletproof vest on will take the wind out of your chest like you are not just getting up and recovering from Absolutely. a bulletproof vest but you know it's fine it's all good i i have to talk to you about my feelings about gail because go ahead i'm here for it I, again, watched all the movies. I think she's my least favorite of the original core four. I agree. I agree. And here's the thing. Since, because of that, I think that that's why they needed to give her something this. this. Well, let going. me say that I also feel like the Gale that is set up in the original trilogy is this Gale that... Um, is this cutthroat, will do anything to get ahead. Her arc is through her relationship with Dewey, she learns to value human life in her own way. That is the original arc that's set up for this woman. That's all I want to say. So when Dewey dies in five, I'm, I'm calling it Scream 5. I'm not calling yeah, it Scream. I know. No. Um, <laughs> when Dewey dies, this would have been such a great opportunity to show like, Gail always thought that Dewey would be there. Like, I'm going to go and do my own thing and I'll come back and he'll always be there. But what happens when he's not there? It would have been, I think, so much more um, fulfilling to see that the death of Dewey made a significant shift in Gail's outlook on life. To show, like, there's that one moment where uh, in Scream 6 where she's talking to uh sam and you know you hear dewey's theme song kind of playing in the yeah. background and she's like talking about like without yeah. really naming him that dewey meant but i'm like you could have done that in such a bigger more significant way just by changing the way she tried to help these people she could have done it through kindness instead of through her normal bullshit but just to show her oh she's she's fucking some black dude now like she's moved on <laughs> like, she doesn't give a fuck really about anything that's happened in her life thus far. And I just felt like, oh, that's so disappointing to see that, like, there was nothing about her relationship with Dewey that made a long-term impact on her character. I'm not, I'm not going to disagree with you there. I feel like it's kind of Gail, like, that's what I said, it's kind of like a retread with Gail. There were some yeah. things where I was like, oh, we're doing this again, and I feel like I would have wanted more growth from you. But at the exact same time, I can't let, like I said, I looked at it and I was like, maybe asking for that much growth is too much for someone like Gail. Like, that's maybe. one of the things that Dewey was like, was Dewey was like, look, every time we try to move forward, you want to go back. You need the attention. Yeah. You need, th you need this story. More than more than you need me. That was kind so. Of the what's thing. her arc then? If that's who she started as and who she ends as, then there's no growth I, for her character. So when she I gets see. stabbed in this one, I'm like, all right. Well, and <laughs> like, but what I'd say is, I will say that I again, I don't disagree with you. I do like her whole tell Sydney he never got me. Like yeah, that, that whole thing. It was just like okay, you know what it. it 
Gale put up a fight. And I do think there is something to be said about like you Gale is not one of these children. She's also not one of these strange adults who has like no idea. Gale yeah. has been through this a few times. And I, I, what I want more than anything is someone who has learned. Um, yeah. If you're going to be a legacy character, Kirby, let's talk about Kirby. Really let's quick. talk How'd about, you Kirby? about Kirby. How'd you feel about Kirby? You start with Kirby. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 I'll say this. Um, it was interesting. I found out this is the first role that Hayden Pantier has done in years, like I think like five years or whatever. Um, it it was kind of like I'm I'm not a lie, nothing, no shade to Hayden Pantier. It was weird because she was the cheerleader for so long. So to see her older, I was like, yo, I'm old. Like that was like one of my first reactions. But I actually do like the idea of like her being like, all right, I'm gonna not let this like make me scared i'm gonna take on the role of being in the fbi and then also when we hear the other cops say that she got dismissed from the fbi i was like i don't know is that true like he could have been saying anything but i do believe kirby would become someone who like gets a fascination is just like you know what i'm going to take down serial killers i'm going to this is going to be my drive so it made sense um so i thought her I thought her addition gave us access that we usually wouldn't have. And I thought that it was a well-written version. And then also there's a moment where Kirby's behavior is sketchy. And I'm like, I don't know. So when they're like, it's Kirby, I'm like, makes sense. Could be. I don't know who to trust. I literally just don't know who to trust at this point in time. So, yeah. Okay. Again, controversial hot take. (laughs) I feel like everything that made Kirby's character initially likable in Scream 4 was stripped away from her in Scream 6. We have Mindy. Mindy is the new Kirby. Also, her personality and her love of film is tied to her legacy character that she's a descent of. Like, it makes sense for her to be the film person. So if we have her... Kirby feels like someone who should have come in and like from the perspective of horror movies and like a new take, like I feel like Kirby should have gave the franchise talk. Like she should have been this person that came in and maybe her and Mindy kind of like worked off of each other or whatever, but like she was the movie person. So her making a cop when she came in never really made sense to me. I didn't also like how she's like, I hate when movies do this where it's like, I'm a cop, but I wear a leather jacket. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't follow the rules. It just feels like you just came, yeah. like, came off the street. Absolutely. Like, I don't know. So like, when they're it's like, still a movie. You know what I mean? It's still a movie, yeah. Still a movie. And so when they're like, when Dermot Maloney's like, oh, she's not a cop anymore. She, she got taken off the force because of whatever. I'm like, okay, now we're getting into something interesting. Because to me, and I know we're going to get to the killer reveal in a bit. Had that twist been a part of it, had it been not Richie's family from the previous movie, which I could do without that entire thing, and it be Kirby went around and collected survivors or people who were impacted by the Scream franchise throughout the entire thing and created a cult so that there was a person for every costume on the shrine that came out, people from Scream, the 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 girl who played Sydney in Scream 3, who was set up as a red herring, who yeah. went away, like all these people, the the the, the cameraman from Scream 2, it you could have made it a like a far from home, no way home type of like yeah. franchise thing. And that to me, with Kirby as the lead, would have been so much more satisfying. So, anyways, like that's I, I like right. what they I'm did not, with Kirby, but I'm not denying that that would be way more satisfying. I feel like the cult idea is still something like maybe they're trying to put together. I feel like it's absolutely possible. Oh, I don't I, feel like it's possible after this movie. I feel like they feel like after the shrines, I'm just like, oh, you had your chance. You had your chance to well, do the cult. They, well, maybe, but all all I'm saying is the way that they've written these characters and the way that they even like set it up is it still it does its job of misdirect. It does its job yeah. of endearing you and it does its job of being like, hey, this is the sixth version of this movie. And it does all of those things really well, where it's just like how like I feel like the cult idea would have been great, but also the cult idea would have been expected. You know what I mean? So I, it's some I, of the things. Can I tell you why I think the cult one would have been so great for this particular movie? 
The idea that I'm on the subway and there's a bunch of people wearing masks and I can't really see them and I don't really know from a, I just got out of the pandemic mentality of like, I'm going to the grocery store and I'm seeing everyone wearing masks. Like you could have just made this so much more tied to the fear and panic that is present in our culture currently by making it this thing of just like anyone could be a fucking killer. But it killer. is. And that's the thing. Like, that's what, what that's what I like about this movie is that it is about the fears, but it's not tying its fear specifically to COVID. It's tying its fear to where we're at as a society. The idea that Mindy is on the train and yeah. she can get stabbed. And there are people with their headphones on. There are people, there's a girl asleep. Like, she's not alone. And I think that one of the biz, one of the craziest things about Scream and being in the suburbs is, like, for years, being out in the suburbs, the cops will never get here on time. Like, that's one of those things where you're like, oh, safety in numbers, safety in the street. Yeah. But New York, and as someone who used to live in New York, New York being the setting for this one, is so genius because the and one of the very first kills that we get when the roommate is in the other room and the guy across the street is just like, hey, and he's like trying to get their attention. He calls yeah. and she ignores. And you're like, killer's in the house. They're right outside the room. Someone is seeing what's going on and trying to tell other people. And no one's paying attention because that's 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 how cities work there, there were like, some genuinely it. good moments in terms of playing into the paranormal that you're talking about of being in public and also being alone of being around people and also being unsafe i wish they would have leaned into it a little bit more but i will say that this movie does it better than a lot of the other going to sequels. the convenience store the convenience store yeah. like again you're always like go in and like the dude has a shotgun and you're like all right we should be safe, but we know that we're not. And I think that that's really interesting. The fact that, A, we know that there's more than one killer. So we're, even though we see someone in front of our face, we're like, is anyone else showing up? Yeah. Like, that that kind of, like, that sense of not being safe in public and not knowing who you can trust is exactly of the time even the people who you deem closest to you there's a moment where we get a fake out where they go mindy and you're like yo is it mindy because every we, all of our suspects we've eliminated so far the only person who's missing is mindy and i'm like i i was like it could be i don't think it is but it could be and the fact yeah. that i questioned it made me be like you guys you understand that even those closest to us aren't safe and i really you know, enjoyed that i i have to say that there is this type of so there's whodunits obviously yeah. but you know a scream and a whodunit is essentially like a a, a paranoid thriller right yeah some uh, i don't know if you've ever seen john carpenter's the thing to me it's like the best paranoid movie of all time you would love it it's it's <laughs> these men are at the south pole and they're they're uh you know working together in these small confines and there's an alien that can transform itself into a person and so they don't know who to trust and the whole yeah. thing is like oh well who who is who how can i trust that you're you and how keep in mind this movie came out during the AIDS crisis. So yeah. when they're like taking blood to test to see who has it and who does it, it's very symbolic. It originally is a remake of a movie that came out during the Red Scare yeah. of just like, who can I trust? These type of whodunits are always so great when the tension in our country is who can I trust? Correct. And so like, I feel like this movie, the reason why there are things that succeed about it is when it really plays into that idea of just like, wow, yeah, we've been walking around for a year or two when everyone had a mask on and I couldn't even see someone what their face really looked like with a hoodie on. So, you know, am I safe in public? This movie plays into that really well. Not only that, but like, also let's talk about the fact that like, there are like this idea of masculinity saving you. There mm. are several big men who get taken down immediately. There, I mean, like, again, let's like, there are all these things that we are told will protect us. There are big men, there are shotguns, there is guns in the home, there are police nearby. Like there are all of these yeah. things that are supposed to be safety net. But if someone wants to get to you, they're going to get to you. Yeah. And I think that that is really important. I think that that's, um, 
I, I love that this movie understood that and setting it in New York and being like, hey, by the way, that fear isn't absolved just by being in a city. I feel like it gives the franchise legs. You know, I feel like this franchise, unfortunately, instead of like setting the path, it's been stealing a lot from the Halloween franchise in terms of like, if you watch Halloween and then you watch Halloween Kills, the violence, the gore, the Michael Myers is a force of nature in Halloween Kills. Like he is just tearing through people like crazy. It's so amped up violence wise. This movie feels very similar. This isn't a ghost face that's stumbling. This isn't a ghost face that's like tripping over cords. This is a ghost this face is. that's coming after you. This what is are like you talking a about? killer. This is a well, well, I mean, I think it depends on which version you're talking about, but this is a ghost face again where Gail bodies like like when, when I wonder which out, one she had. Yeah. I know, but this is what I'm saying. It's just like it's a very interesting mix but also by giving us three killers which we're about to talk about the killers by giving us three killers it also again subverts our expectations and it allows it to be a situation of well seriously who can you trust because even people who you think are eliminated aren't eliminated people who you keep your eye on it can be distracted they can be used as a distraction you know what I'm saying? Like, Let's talk about the killer reveal because I have I, I have okay. to talk to you about this. So the killer reveal, first of all, it's a little bit of an homage for, again, if you watch it, you'll know that the killer turns out to be Richie's family. And it turns out to be his dad, which, again, the moment the officer is like, since when my son died, I was like, your son is one of the previous killers. I don't mm-hmm. know which one, but I know one of the previous killers is your son. I know that because you mentioned when your son died, your life went to hell. Didn't didn't think it was Richie just because it was so soon, but like sure. that pays an homage to uh Billy's mother being the killer in Scream 2. Again, it's kind of like we're going back to the beginning and it's a parent avenging their their child. So there's that. Then it's uh Richie's two siblings, the brother, which again, the brother, I never trusted, not even for a second. I was like, yeah. I can't wait for you to die. I don't know yeah. who you are, but I never trusted you. And the moment you die will just be cathartic. And then number three is the sister Quinn. And again, the moment Quinn went back inside and grabbed the phone in the bedroom, it was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was like, Quinn's the killer. That's it. But then Quinn gets killed. And I was yeah. like, oh, I just knew Quinn was the killer. I Can knew- I just say that after watching all the movies, I hate when Scream does the fake kill. To me, really? it feels like such a lazy way of trying to trick us so that we don't know who the final killer is. Did versus- you know it was Quinn at the end? I mean, I just asked you the question. Did you know? No, I honestly didn't expect it. But again, it's like I've seen them do the fake kill in so many sequels at this point now. So at this point, it's just like no one's death really feels permanent until the final act when the reveal happens. And I just, I don't know. When you watch the first Scream movie, as people die, the the, the shortlist gets smaller and smaller. So that scene in the first movie where um, you have uh, Randy and you have Stu trying to come into the house and Sydney's like, I'm locking you both out. That makes sense. There's tension that's building organically within the story. There's no like, oh, Tatum actually is actually alive and she's coming out of the woods. Billy wood. is like, actually like the whole the whole third act is I, Billy. You know what? You're right. You're right. And Billy does that, but that's also what I mean. wait, they've wait, done wait. it in every movie. But what I want to say is, it's also cla- like it's classic who done it, like Agatha Christie level. Go back, someone who you thought was dead. Uh, someone you eliminated from the list isn't actually dead and it's one of those situations to where it it preys on your adrenaline you're so hyped up you're not noticing again just from the fact that one of the clues like there are so many clues that are like and breadcrumbs that are left in there the fact that someone took all of their all the knives yeah i was like so it's someone in the house yeah. It has to be someone in the house because we just saw Sam check the knives. So the fact that all the knives are gone means that the killer was in the house. I'm not and saying it... it's not a successful plot device to have someone <laughs> fake their death. I'm just saying this franchise leans on it far too heavily. Oh, that's all. And, and you think that that's better than a guy who could just keep coming back to life no matter well, what? Well, no. Again, <laughs> I, I, 
you know, we're going to get into the like our final thoughts on this, but I would argue that this series would benefit from being serialized versus trying to we'll get into it later but i I just i i i I struggle with this idea that there's so much homage happening to the original movie and all of these previous movies that the conversation is now becoming a conversation about scream instead of a conversation about horror movies which was what made the first one so interesting and see i and i i'm gonna disagree with you there i felt like there were so many homages to different slashers specifically 90s slashers but so many like that that scene of Samara weaving in the alley is is I know what you did last summer. It is um, Sarah Michelle Geller in that alley. Help is right down the road, and that's what I got from that moment. And I was just like, oh, there are lots of things where it feels like it's like we know you've seen all the modern slashers, and and it's trying to address those. Also, let's just talk about the idea. Uh, a little bit of their them commenting on redditors and conspiracy theories and ruining someone's reputation it's like it's not enough just to kill someone now you need to kill their um their what's the word i'm looking for their good name you know their reputation, like that's, that's a, and that's I an interesting like that's concept. A, I feel like that but was so. I don't dead feel like they really leaned right into now. it. I feel like the Reddit thing they did in Scream Five when Richie was like, "Oh, and me and this girl." By the way, I love that this new trilogy is like, "Don't trust white people. All the white <laughs> people are the killers. Don't trust them." Um, but in the last one, they were like, "Oh yeah, we met on Reddit. We read on," and that's honestly how. Billy's mom met Mickey in Scream 2. We met on the chat room. Like, it just feels like there are these serial killer networks. Well, first of all, there <laughs> are. Like, let's talk about that. People always are going to find a way to connect. Like, that's 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 where that is. People find each other. Uh, again, technology. How are we letting people connect with each other? But also, like, and is the idea that people with similar ideas get to come together. Is that always a good thing but also the idea of using like when um samantha is recorded by that one girl who assaulted her and then it's on the news the next day yeah as oh look at her attacking this girl it's like no reputation like sydney's not sydney so that, that goes to show you but samantha's reputation is also being dragged even though she is the victim and i think that is really important that you can create different narratives i, I feel like scream 4 does this so much better when they're talking about sydney as the angel of death versus sympathizing with her as a victim that's what i mean the concept that you're saying there's nothing wrong with them i've just seen them in all the other scream movies and i just want something new i just okay, want something okay, different okay okay you know what? I will give you that. I I feel I personally I'm not gonna lie. I'm being a little bit defensive because I'm like, what's your franchise doing? <laughs> Tell me how Halloween did this. All right. No. Tell me what I'm Halloween not that, did. You. I'm not saying that <laughs> Halloween is even a better franchise. I'm just saying that like the thing that made Scream One so fresh mm-hmm. was that it, it felt different, and yeah. all of the sequels feel like an homage to the first movie versus there being commentary. Like the last movie, they bring up Babadook, they bring up Jordan Peele, like they bring up these art house like Midsommar movies, but then they don't really do anything with it. They're like, oh yeah, those are nice, but we're not we're not going to comment on that really. And it just feels like it's like, well, that's what's happening in horror. So like, why aren't you being the commentary? Why aren't you having the conversation while simultaneously participating in it in a way that's equally enjoyable? And I feel like the first movie is the only one that successfully does Here's that. Thing. That I will give you. Now, I will say that this talks about it's a franchise. And with yeah. franchises, the stories get a little paint by numbers. Like, if we're talking, like, think of Fast and Furious. Think of <laughs> James Bond. They, yeah. like, there are just certain things where it's just like, oh, I know what we're doing. Because this is what we have to do. You're not you you are not going to give me anything wildly outside of the realm because you can't do that. I know that Michael Myers is coming back. I know that Jigsaw, it's all going to come together in the final act. Like sure. I just know these things because it's a franchise, and by it being a franchise, the only way that you can surprise me, like I think of like Final Destination, uh, is a really good one where it's like the surprise and the last one that they did was that it was actually a prequel. That was the surprise. 
Yeah. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the, the last of the uh, Fast and Furious one. But what I feel like is just this nation, yeah. by them moving, moving this to New York into a city filled with people with ways that you think not only do these do the regular tropes of being isolated in suburbia not apply, but these people have grown up watching every single movie just as much as you have, and they should know better, and they should be behaving differently. And in some ways they do, and it doesn't really help. Like, And again, if you're planning for two killers, for example, what are you going to do when there's three? That's That's where I'm at. Yeah. I mean, we definitely <laughs> reached the Jason takes Manhattan part of the franchise. <laughs> exactly. But in a way, that's good. Like, yeah, like, no, again, I, will okay, not, right. I will not allow you. I will not allow you. can have your problems with say ways that, no, I'm just saying, you can say there are ways that this could be better. And mm-hmm. I will not fight you on that. But I can't, I will not allow you to pretend that this sixth installment of this franchise is, is better than most six installments of any other franchise. Exactly. I will hands down <laughs> agree with you. I truly was looking through like all the major horror franchises and other than like Nightmare on Elm Street, I can't think of a franchise where I'm like, oh, I would actually willingly return to these films of this franchise often. And like even Scream, I'm not returning to all of them. But yeah. there are a few that I will go back to. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but my point is just that let's do our rankings since we're here. And like, okay. Let's try to wrap this up. <laughs> all right. So, your ultimate scream ranking how do you rank all of the movies starting from worst to best? Worst to best. Okay. So, I just got to read it backwards. Um, uh, it's really hard. I know other people feel differently. I feel like Scream 2022. Is right there on the bottom for me. Scream like, five, you mean? Scream five, yeah. I yeah. just for me, it's on the bottom. It really missed the mark. It to me, it felt the most like you guys missed what Scream was about, and you just needed to tell another story. Like that to me, uh, we got some really good characters. I'm not gonna lie, the twins coming in was really good. But outside of that, I'm I'm literally sitting here being like. And I even really remember most of the other like kills, you know what I mean? Like nothing's really memorable to me. Um, and I feel like they use technology wrong. I just I didn't like it. Then three. Three has grown on me with some time Mm-mm. because it feels no. very kitsch. <laughs> it no, here's the thing, I'm not gonna lie. At this point in time, living in LA, knowing certain things, I feel like three is not great. But it actually, it fits in. It does a lot of fun, campy things. If you're going to have a campy version in your movie, that was a fun, campy version of that. Then I'm going to go. Oh, all right. (laughs) We're we're doing my ranking. We're doing my (laughs) ranking. You can talk about you in a little bit. Then I'm going to go. I said, so we did. uh, We did five and three. Three. um, Four. I really enjoyed four. Actually, you know what? I take that back. I'm going to go two. So it goes, for me, it goes five, three, two. And I know that's very controversial because a lot of people like two more. But I feel like I was, there are moments in two where I'm bored. Oh, and yeah. I'm really also, I, I, in terms of third act problems, Scream 2 is right up there. Like, all of these movies exactly. have third act problems. Exactly. Scream third, 2 especially. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a third act Third act is not its shining star, which is crazy because the first one, the third act, really like just it sets on fire. Um, then I'm gonna go four because mm-hmm. I I thought four was actually really good. I really thought that four it gives us Kirby, it gives us a new generation, mm-hmm. and what I wanted more than anything, and I feel like the franchise almost shot itself in the foot, and which is why they had to do 2022, is if they would have let Jill. God I can't. Me. I can't have this conversation with you again. Jill okay. needed to have succeeded in she Scream Four. Have succeeded. That Has should have succeeded? been the new, the new trilogy. It would. 100%. It would. It would have been phenomenal. It would have been so. It needed to do that. It would have subverted expectations. It would have changed the game. We would have been able to get so many new stories. We could have gotten the cult thing like almost mm-hmm. immediately. Jill being the killer. And surviving and her plan going off that scene where Jill is on the stretcher and she is and all the cameras are asking her that is your final scene that's where that movie needs to end 
and it's perfect. You can even bring Sydney could have not died. We can find that out. Like all of that, I didn't need. I needed Jill to succeed because she earned it, and that's what the movie told me. And because yeah. she didn't, that is the only reason why that one's my number three. Then I'm going this one. I actually feel like I feel like it takes everything that we've had. Everything that we hated about five, everything that we joked about three, everything that we loved about the planning and a new generation of four, and it puts it all together and it gives me a fresh story. I know that you don't feel it so fresh, but I feel like for this franchise, it gave me the most, I don't know who the killer is, and it could be anyone feeling that I haven't had since one, which of course is my number one. All right, you give me your ranking. Well, at the bottom of my list is Scream 3. For Courtney Cox's bangs alone, Scream 3 <laughs> serves to be at the bottom of the list. Those bangs um, are atrocious. Also, I hate Parker Posey in that movie. I find her to be so annoying. Um, Controversial take, a- I'm with you. I don't really enjoy Parker Posey. I feel like she overdoes it all the time. But in that one... Again, if we're going camp, I feel like three is just pure camp. Like, you've got to watch three going in being like... If you this- want a campy movie, <laughs> serial movie, watch Bride of Chucky. It's a way better, campier okay. slasher film. Like, if this is just a not good movie. It's not satisfying. Anyways, Sydney apparently has a brother, got brought up for a second, never brought up again, whatever. Yeah. Um, after Scream 3, I'm going Scream 5. And for all the reasons you said... Um, The reason why Scream 5 suffers as a reboot of the franchise is because if you're watching the movies in order, all of the main beats to reboot reboot a franchise, they do in Scream 4. So now we have to do a reboot right after a reboot, and it suffers from it. It really suffers from it. Also, I cannot stress to you enough that the, the killer reveal of Scream 5 is maybe the worst killer reveal of all time. To think, to think that... The uh, Tara's friend, who is five two, five <laughs> two, kills Dewey yeah. and guts him like a fi- no. There's yeah. physically no way. Like, and that's the to. thing is that they uh, the last few movies have been hiring like a stunt person to be Ghostface, yeah. and then when you watch the movie, they're like, "Uh, that makes visually no sense. Yeah. It does yeah. not work. I can't follow it." Um. Scream 2, I'm going to put at my number four spot. Um, Scream 2 is, like you said, other than the opening scene with Jada Pickett, which is the best part about that entire movie, Absolutely, by the way, absolutely. Um, the second act is boring, and the third act is uh, it, it is just like, wait, what is this? The only thing that is so frustrating about Scream 2 is that like in Scream 2, you have Sydney pursuing acting, and then in, in Scream 3, it turns out that her mom was an actress, and they never make the tie. Like they never yeah. connect yeah. it. It's so frustrating. You're right. You're Anyways, right. um, so that's Scream 2. I thought it, the whole Billy's mom thing being the killer, it, it felt very like an homage to Psycho at a point where we've already had so many homages to Psycho that it was boring. I wasn't into it. And also that script changed the killer's last minute. So if you yeah. watch it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. A lot of the ones that I will say, like really quickly, Scream 2 and Scream 3 and even Scream 4, what they suffered the most from is last minute changes. Like yeah. when you know what it was supposed to be, you're like, that would have been good. And I see all those pieces there. And then there were leaks or whatever, and they changed it. And you're like, like you should have just stuck with it. You should have just stuck with it. Keep Scream going. 3 feels like the most circle jerk movie of just like, let's just make a movie about us, about how we make these movies. And I was just like, oh. But it like, wasn't so you're... supposed to be that. Like the script got leaked and they had to do a whole new script. And then like, take another year. Then take another year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, All right, Scream okay. 6 falls next on my list. And it's mostly because, again, they made the last one a year ago. Like, if you watch this movie, it was a very exciting movie. But I think that, like, in terms of watching it, it's going to be a fun, like, Halloween something to have on in the background. But to actually enjoy the story, I don't know that I'm going to because what story is there really in Scream 6 other than a bunch of survivors try to move on and they get hunted again? Like, there's so many, like I said, the whole thing with the franchise, bringing in legacy characters as the killers would have been really interesting, setting up this ghost face cult to where so many people are ghost face and people you didn't expect bringing back people from the uh, former movies would have been so much interesting having kirby go from 
obsessed with movies to the killer makes so much more sense than I'm a police officer and I'm going to dress up like a costume. You're a cop. You can kill me in broad daylight. <laughs> you can get away with it. Why are you going? <laughs> Maybe that's why they didn't do it. They're like, how are cops any different? <laughs> it's it just to me, I'm just like, okay, whatever. Um, Scream 4 is in my number two slot for all the reasons you said. I feel like in terms of rebooting it, I feel like that's a far more satisfying version of a reboot. I, I again, up until the last, you know, killer reveal thing where they just have Jill getting shot in the forehead like they do with every killer at the end of every movie. I'm so bored of this shot in the forehead thing. It, 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 that movie is probably the most enjoyable to rewatch in yes. terms of like they're yes. talking about the Stab franchise and how yep. they're doing it. I love the idea of, oh, the next progress in these line of killings is not to kill people. It's to live stream it. It's to put it on the Internet. It's to frighten large groups of people at once with one act that is the most interesting idea that this franchise has had that they just completely abandoned well and then also like this is the reason why screen 4 got moved down is specifically because of the fact that they don't commit to the mm -hmm. to the really great swings that they took the idea of jill doing this for celebrity at a time where mm -hmm. being a reality star like we it was saw, everything. like it was it was everything and it became the next 10 years they called it and had they just let her gotten away with it honestly the fact that they don't let her get away with it and get what she wants which is what needed to happen and would have been very like foreshadowing of like a trump or someone who's like they use their misdeeds to gain celebrity would have been great but then also i have to deduct points from the opening of Scream 4. Oh, Scream like, 4 has the weakest opening. I will say the that. The weakest like, opening. The, the movie because... within the movie within the movie thing, it's it's it, it's it's it doesn't bullshit. make sense. <laughs> um my I, I have to just say this. If Scream 4 had ended with Jill getting away, then we find out in Scream 5 that there is a cult that's now hunting Jill. And then we find out that through some series of events, the person in the final ghost face mask who kills Jill is actually Sydney who survived and like did it to like, I, I that's, a, I want to watch that series. Like I want to watch a killer getting away with it and them having to like keep the facade up and Correct. the cracks in the foundation. And now they're getting stalked by someone. And who is this person who thinks they're me? Like so many interesting things we could have done. Obviously scream one is at the top again, Scream 1 is the only movie that succeeds in having the conversation and participating in the genre and both of those things being equally interesting. When we get into Scream 2, they're like, here's the rules for a sequel. Here's the rules for a trilogy. Here's the rules for a reboot. Here's the rules for a, a, a requel. A requel. But, and like, it just After a while, it's just like, clearly none of these rules are working. <laughs> Well, no one like, is surviving other than the core characters. So clearly these rules aren't working. Tell me and, tell me right now, what genre are we in with horror movies? Like what what genre is there to participate in? Right now, well, that's what I mean. Like right now, franchise. there's so many interesting things happening with non-franchise horror movies, and it almost feels like the easiest conversation to have is, well, let's have a conversation about these big legacy franchises. But like, we're in the age it, of MCU, baby. Like, franchise is the only thing they could have done. Like, what I'm saying is, right now, well, then do it. Is then do it. Defined. Bring it back. Give me No Way Home. Give me like eight movies worth of Scream Killers or something. Like if you're going to have the shrine, you'll get that and eight. Build it, <laughs> like if you're going to have the TV that killed Stu, like all these collectible things, like do it. Like lean into this is a multiverse franchise and we're bringing back people. Like that would have been it. This just, it doesn't stick the landing the way that Scream 1 does. And by the way, Scream 1, the reveal of two killers was so... Yes. Revolutionary. Yes. That to just simply add a third killer or a fourth killer or whatever for the sequels, like it to me, it doesn't have the initial impact of, oh, I was afraid of one person, but I should have been afraid of two. Like th that is the Bruce Willis six sense like reveal that they keep trying to redo that magic trick and it never but how, ever again, feels as good as bottle. the first one. Lightning in a bottle. You can't sometimes, sometimes you just can't make a home alone again. You know, like sometimes it's just not. And okay, so it. this is this is what I was saying. This I feel like this series would have been better if it was serialized. Give me Scream talking about 
you know, slasher films, and then give me Scream 2, completely new cast, completely new subject matter. Talk about a different part of the horror genre. Maybe where, like, the thing that Scary Movie does, which is actually really interesting, is that they are talking about, like, the first movie is about slashers, but the second one is more about ghost movies, and the third one is more about alien movies, and, and like, they're really tackling all of these different parts of the subgenres of horror in ways that Scream is like, no, we're just gonna keep talking about these one type of horror movies just the slashers just the slashers and i feel like they would benefit from evolving past that conversation that they've had six times now well, so something to look forward to the, in the future um uh, as, as I, I, I feel like i'm coming down really hard i really did enjoy scream six i had a good time with it but i again my only gripe my only complaint is that the first one just did something so original so fresh and it just feels like they're afraid of taking risks because we talked about many cases within the sequels specifically scream 4 where they had the opportunity to take a risk and do something fresh again but then they reverted back to default and it's just like boring now i'll say this i'll say 100% uh, as we wrap this conversation up i agree with you that i'm looking at the movies with all of the decisions that have already been made in mind. And I feel like six does the best job that it can considering all the decisions that we like considering the foundation that it's currently built on. If you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I feel like it does what it can given all the pieces that it has to me. I feel like the franchise would be completely different had four going a different way. I feel like four was its greatest opportunity to really shake up everything and give us a, a scream one type ending to where we were like anything is possible. Yeah. They didn't, they went back to formula and because they went back to formula, they essentially told us that they would continue to do formula. And I feel like six is the best of that formula holistically let me ask you this what do you need to see in the trailer for scream 7 to get you interested because i have to be honest like if they're just going to do another movie in new york i don't know that that's going to do it for me i don't know if they're going to see i don't know if they'll do another one in new york in reality let's go to paris like you know, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, like, you know I mean? like at some point in time i think i i think it's interesting because if the only thing i can think of that would come close um to like screaming in space genre, well not screaming space but like the only like the genre is when you start to bring in social commentary but i mean like racial like that's what nope is that's yeah. like that like that's what um midsommar brings in gender dynamics like if you really want to talk about what horror is doing right now you have to start really going to places that i don't know if we want kevin williamson to go i don't know if that's his space and i don't know if he would be able to do so in a way well i have to say that kevin williamson was the one who originated the idea of the scream cult and his idea kept getting pushed under the rug by the studios it seems like so i don't feel like they've really let him have the vision that he's wanted for this franchise either which is sad um yo i would be incredibly interested if scream 7 was this really like budget confined intimate type of uh almost like what prey was for the uh, predator series where it's sydney isolated in the woods and the like there's a scream and it's just a very intimate one-on-one kind of like did you ever see the movie hush on that place yes yes about the deaf woman and yes. she has to like figure like i that's the movie i want you know Sydney, what? one ghost space in the house i have kids i'm trying to protect it and that's the movie scream give me that seven cabin in the woods i actually feel would work i also feel like that's a genre in and of itself of course and i feel like i feel like you have something there to where we can do like you're right let's 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 strip it all of everything let's bring it back to just the core element of in a house protecting your family what can you do what and can I, you do and I really do like, I, I like that idea. I don't think Strip they're going to do down. it, but I do like it. I no, do like it. They're going to keep throwing budget at it. We're going to get Scream on the cruise boat. Like, whatever is going to happen next. I, I'm sure we're going to get another movie in a year, by the way, because this one's Absolutely. doing so well. They're going to turn it out as fast as possible. Final question. Final, final, final question. Final, final question. Yeah, yeah. Favorite kill of this movie? Of the movie? Oh, I thought you were going to say of the franchise. Um, uh, Scream 6, favorite movie. Favorite kill. I think it was Tony Ravalori's 
kill in the beginning because that was the one that I had the least expectations of. Like, that's the one that kind of came out of nowhere, that the Scream mask wearer is the person who's getting the phone call. I just thought that was really interesting. In terms of, like, kills and deaths, it, it all kind of blurs together for me. I want to say I feel like the latter scene really does it oh, yeah, defines yeah. itself as one of those all the pieces are there. We know what's happening. We know where we're going, but it still delivers. I just feel like yeah. it's one that it's going to it's going to make itself notable in the franchise. That idea, and I, and I like that actress. I thought she did really good. I thought yeah. everything about that situation made sense, and I really, I really thought that it did well. Do you have a favorite killer of the franchise? Um, Jada. I just feel like Jada's is the I'm like as black people watching this thing you're always like that wouldn't be me and so to see jada be like that wouldn't be me i'd be out of there like yeah. it it really strikes a note and it it's the very first time that we get a public people around you that's what i was going to say all the things that were scary about death happening in public that happened in the last few movies happened the best in that scream two that scream two it's just like here's the thing i go to any scream movie and i immediately think of that scene where it's like uh, the killer could be in this room (laughs) also you take that scene out of that movie you have a very worse movie i agree (laughs) Um, no, the worst killer uh, killer of the whole franchise, like I said, was Courtney K- Cox's bangs in Scream 3. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. For those of you who stuck with us this long, <laughs> you know how we were. I'm not even going to apologize. Um, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Thank you guys so much for listening to us. Please be sure to rate us. Know that we are coming back to season six. And just so you know, if you made it to this long, you guys have been doing really great at sending us emails and conversations on Instagram. Please continue to do so. We have been getting your emails. We have been getting your responses. Um, as I said earlier, we've been a little behind the ball with season uh, six ourselves, but just know that we will be coming back with more um, episodes for Broadway Meets World. Um, Steve, do you have anything else you want to say? No, um, I would just, again, Please check out Scream 6 and let us know your thoughts in in the comments and just let us know what you thought about the movie and how you felt like we, uh, if we we missed anything that you guys wanted to talk about. Like, why is Sam hooking up with a random dude? You should know better. Like, uh, I like that random dude. I thought that, I thought, I thought their relationship with that dude where he was just, she was like, you know what? I don't know you. I was like, yes, we learn it. Okay. Uh, You guys, you know us. So please follow us at Brown Meets World. Leave us a rating. Tell us how much you like us. Tell us how much you appreciate us. Um, and we will do the same. Um, and I think there's nothing more to say than dream, cry, and do good. Do Later, bruz. Later, bruh. When the spawn meets world.